started this series discussing the effects of trauma, and we're fortunate enough today to be joined with Zeno Bacchus, correct, with the Montana U.S. Attorney's Office and Brandon Walker with the FBI for a broader discussion on human trafficking and its impacts in Billings and Montana. So thank you all for being here. A uh, round of applause for these two to get us started, okay? Thanks for that introduction. Uh, my name is Brandon Walter. I'm an FBI agent here in Billings. Um, just a little, uh, I, I guess I'll give you short background and let Zeno introduce himself. Uh, I grew up in Billings. Um, I was at one time a research scientist studying viruses uh, and uh, at some point I changed careers. In 2007 I joined the FBI. Uh, I was able to start out my career in Portland, Oregon, and then move back home to Billings uh, in about 2011. So at that time, I worked uh, violent crime on the Crow and Northern Cheyenne Indian reservations, uh, and then uh, have since uh, been focused almost solely on human trafficking um, and uh, child exploitation. Um, so I'll let Zeno do his own introduction. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zeno Bacchus. My title is Assistant United States Attorney with the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Billings, Montana. I joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in January of 13, was in our Helena branch for about two, three years, and then we moved over to Billings, um, I think in August of 15, if memory serves. For those don't yet know, no, excuse me, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office enforces violations of federal, federal criminal law. Um, and since 2016, one of my hats I wear has been the human trafficking coordinator for the District of Montana. Uh, what that means is every so often I get together with federal, state, and local law enforcement and talk about what we're seeing in terms of the human trafficking context in the state of Montana. Uh, the District of Montana encompasses the entire state. And we also talk about kind of ongoing investigations, prosecutions, and changes in the law. As a human trafficking pro prosecutor and coordinator, I prosecute human trafficking violations, among other type of violations that I prosecute. So I imagine as we talk this afternoon, I'll kind of give some more stories or lessons learned in terms of what we've been seeing in the district in terms of human trafficking and prosecution. So thanks again for coming out today, though. Pretty much appreciate it. Billings uh, and the surrounding area. Um, we may talk also a little bit about child exploitation. Uh, these are cases that Zeno and I work hand in hand. Uh, you can see some of the seals on this initial slide, including the FBI, the United States Attorney's Office. Those are the larger ones. Uh, this is definitely a collaborative effort. Uh, we work hand in hand with the state of Montana, the Division of Criminal Investigation, um, and uh, also Yellowstone County Sheriff's Office and the Billings Police Department. Um, there's one uh, entity that I, I failed to put on this initial slide, and that's the Yellowstone County Attorney's Office. Uh, recently, in addition to all of the cases that we've been working with Zeno and our federal partners at the United States Attorney's Office, uh, we've been uh, fortunate to be involved in prosecutions with the County Attorney's Office also. Uh, the reason I mention that is the state of Montana has very... Um, stringent, uh, severe uh, laws in regard to child exploitation. Um, and so while in many cases uh, federal crimes um, will result in higher sentences, um, in some of these cases some of the county um, prosecutors uh, will be able to get state convictions that have equal or sometimes even more uh, sentence, uh, more time at Deer Lodge than somebody would spend in a federal prison. Um, so I guess I'll just start off. Uh, we plan to go for about an hour. I think this was uh, potentially at some point, maybe we got our wires crossed, we were thinking two hours, uh, but we're, we're going to shoot for about 4 p.m. today just to give you all uh, some idea. So human trafficking, this, is, this will be a collaborative presentation. Uh, if you have questions, please interrupt us. Um, Zeno uh, will chime in at times when he has something uh, important to say. Human trafficking is compelling or coercing another person's labor or services, including commercial sex acts. 
Uh, that coercion can be subtle or overt, phys physical or psychological. Uh, oftentimes when you think of human trafficking, you may be thinking of uh, the movie Taken or some similar situation like that where somebody is kidnapped, somebody is chained up. Uh, this is not what we often see in Montana. Uh, however, the bonds, um, while they're not chains, uh, oftentimes they're psychological bonds. There is oftentimes, and, and if I say female victim uh, over and over again, that is because that's what we observe in Montana. Uh, we have observed some male victims, uh, however, those are very few and far in between compared to the female victims. Uh, these women and these children, these female children, um, are not oftentimes chained up. Uh, they are chained up only in their minds, uh, and that is uh, because it sounds like the previous presentation uh, given um, talked about trauma. That is because these individuals uh, have experienced some trauma in their life, and there is a manipulative predator uh, that is amongst us in Billings. Whether that predator traveled in here from Chicago or Denver or Seattle, or whether that predator came right here from Billings. Uh, Zeno and I have seen both of those cases uh, in Billings. Uh, sometimes individuals that have lived here for more than 15 years they are the, the human traffickers, the people that are taking advantage, advantage of our adult women and sometimes our children. Um, so it, it is definitely not the movie Taken that we see. Uh, it is different than that. And we'll try and explain some more of that as we proceed. So the United States Department, uh, or the US Department of State issues a trafficking in persons report each year. Uh, this one uh, was, this report that I'm going to talk about today was from 2016. At that time there were about 21 million victims worldwide um, of human trafficking. Uh, that number has risen on the most recent reports to a little over 25 million. Um, human trafficking comes in many flavors and commercial sex trafficking is most often the one we see in Montana. Uh, however, there are other forms of trafficking, including child sex trafficking. We see that uh, in Montana also. That's lumped in with sex trafficking. Uh, we see forced labor, bonded labor or debt bondage, domestic servitude, forced child labor, and unlawful recruitment and use of child soldiers. Obviously, in the U.S., we don't have some of these issues. Um, but in fact, I was reading an article uh, in the newspaper just uh, today or yesterday um, discussing uh, child labor. Um, so these are some of the things that, uh, that are occurring here. This presentation will focus mostly on commercial sex trafficking. Uh, that would include uh, children. The numbers, some of the statistics um, are collected by uh, the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, you can see that there's an upward trend uh, happening in the United States. Um, and we've also, uh, the Division of Criminal Investigation has compiled numbers and they have reported um, large increases in percentages and numbers of human trafficking cases happening right here in Montana. So there definitely is an upward trend. Uh, however, I must caveat that with the thought that this upward trend also has to do with the fact that individuals like Zeno um, are working on these cases, uh, and therefore I am working on these cases. County prosecutors are working on these cases. Uh, so we're seeing probably the effect of uh, noticing that this is happening more often um, and not truly uh, an increase uh, as far as the types of crimes, the number of crimes that are being committed. I think it's just that we're more aware uh, that these crimes are happening. So from 2007 to 2019, uh, there's a national uh, human trafficking hotline number. Um, they had approximately 65,000 reports of human trafficking across the United States uh, from 2007 to 2019. Uh, and those numbers continue to, to climb by about 10,000 cases per year. Uh, what this means, the, the, the number for the national hotline is 888 
3737-888. So if somebody sees a poster with that number on it and they observe something that they believe is human trafficking, they'll make a report to that number. Uh, if that number receives a call and they can vet that that's a credible report, then they would come into contact with me um, or another human trafficking investigator um, across the state, maybe even a local uh, police officer or deputy. So human trafficking uh, is a crime that involves victims that are vulnerable. Uh, so you can practically in your own head uh, think of a vulnerable population. Uh, those are the individuals that are going to be targeted by human traffickers. Uh, children that are part of the, the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, runaways, uh, Native American youth, migrant workers, uh, individuals that don't speak English uh, very well, um, persons with disabilities, uh, and LGBTI individuals, all groups of people that have vulnerabilities um, that could be the target of a trafficker. Uh, these traffickers are present in our community. They are watching the street corners. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about some statistics in the future um, that discuss within a day or two of a child being a runaway. Many of them are approached by a trafficker at some point. That doesn't mean that the trafficker will be successful in recruiting them. Um, uh, oftentimes, kids in that situation are street smart uh, and they know better than to go uh, with a trafficker. However, some of our kids that might not be as street smart, maybe just found themselves uh, on the street, uh, have always had a loving, nurturing home to go home to. They might not be as uh, street smart as some of the kids that have found themselves in that situation before. They would be a very prime target. Uh, when somebody asks me about uh, if their child or their grandchild um, would be a target for a trafficker, um, the answer I often give them is, how is your child or grandchild doing uh, in school? Do they have friends? Are they struggling with anything? I'm asking, are they vulnerable? Uh, if that child, uh, when a male at Rimrock Mall walks up to them uh, and looks them in the eye and says, you have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. Have you ever thought about modeling? If that child is able to look that adult male back in the face, um, and say, that's a creepy thing to say, leave me alone. That's not a child you need to worry about. But if that child blushes and looks at their feet, doesn't maintain eye contact, uh, then that is a child that you need to have a discussion with about uh, human trafficking and about the possibility that uh, people, predators in this community, will approach you and ask you things and you need to be aware that that is a person that is trying to hurt you. So there, uh, oftentimes, I, we talked about the, uh, the movie Taken and the kidnapping and the chaining of, uh, chaining of an individual up. Sometimes people think of uh, human trafficking as human smuggling. Uh, what we're not talking about here is we're not talking about somebody transiting from Mexico into the United States. That is not human trafficking, that is human smuggling. Uh, however, in situations like that, we have come across individuals that have set up businesses in Billings, and that's exactly what they were doing a few years ago, uh, and that is uh, recruiting individuals from other countries, um, getting them somehow into Mexico, and then having them walk themselves across the U.S.-Mexican border. Once they get across the border, they move them somehow in the U.S. by um, by vehicle or by plane uh, to another city, and then they say, okay, you now owe me $20,000. Uh, you are going to work in my massage parlor in this big city, um, and all of the money that you make um, will go to me except for your tips, uh, and also you owe me for uh, room and board, uh, and there's also a condom fee that you have to pay me, so you can pay that out of your tips. Uh, so that is a human smuggling situation that in fact turns into human trafficking. Um, we, Zeno prosecuted a massage parlor owner uh, in Billings um, and that was the type of situation that she was involved in uh, prior to her prosecution. So 
there are individuals that have those types of criminal plots in their mind living right here in our community. Uh, if you want to learn more about human trafficking, um, a, a nonprofit uh, set up uh, with collab in collaboration with the U.S. government is the Polaris Project. Um, Polarisproject.org is their website. Uh, you can learn a lot about uh, human trafficking. Uh, oftentimes they do these heat maps. The telephone number that I told you about before, 888-3737-888, um, that is the direct line to the Polaris Project, um, and these heat maps are based upon the calls coming in uh, to those, to that particular number. So you can see here Billings is bright red uh, compared to other cities in our state. Um, you can see Missoula is, is uh, fairly bright red. Um, we'll talk about some statistics that uh, I've compiled also. Um, but in all of our large communities, uh, there are calls coming into this hotline um, on at least probably a weekly basis. I'm going to let Zeno take over here and talk about some of the federal human trafficking statutes. Thank you, Brandon. So in 2000, the TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, was passed by Congress. It's been amended a few times. <clears throat> but the result of that statute really was these two sections of the criminal code. So Title 18, United States Code, which is the USC, and then sections 1589 and 1591, referring to forced labor and sex trafficking, respectively. Um, these are the principal human trafficking statutes of the federal criminal code. And as you'll see in the next few moments, um, just because we, the government, doesn't prosecute somebody under one of these sections doesn't mean that there's not elements of human trafficking involved um, and there's also not stiff penalties. I'll talk about the penalties involving these statutes here as well. Critically, um, one can also charge a forced labor or sex trafficker under a theory of an attempt. Um, you see there rest in, in, reflected in the slides, so essentially somebody attempted to traffic somebody. Obviously conspiracy is also a viable federal charge, and then it's a little legalese, but extraterritorial jurisdiction. So depending on the nationality of the target defendant and the victim, even if the conduct strictly happens overseas, so not in the United States, oftentimes there can be federal jurisdiction for a human trafficking or sex trafficking charge. So it's a little unique as respect to those types of criminal charges. So with respect to, again, sex trafficking specifically, but really human trafficking overall, um, these are the things that we look for because remember, we're talking about somebody being compelled to engage in labor or commercial sex trafficking, commercial sex act. Um, often, Special Agent Walter and I, when we're interacting with victims or viewing evidence in connection with a potential case, see evidence of the uh, kind of the variables listed here. A little less so involving fraud. You don't see that very often. Sometimes that is a viable theory in terms of a human trafficking or sex trafficking prosecution that essentially a victim was tricked, if you will, into engaging in the act, but more so is the evidence of force. If you don't see force, and this is really where the rubber hits the road often in terms of sex trafficking prosecution, it turns on coercion. So a victim was not physically abused, perhaps, by his or her trafficker, but there were elements of coercion at play that compelled that victim to engage in a commercial sex act. Coercion is defined in the federal criminal code there under 1591 subsection E2. Um, and this is the definition of coercion when we go forward on a sex trafficking prosecution. This is the definition that we often talk to a jury about as to why a victim agreed, it's not really an agreement if they're being forced to do it, but why a victim was compelled to engage in a commercial sex act. Um, the notes, the first one, threats of serious harm to or physical restraint against any person, so not just against the victim, Often we see evidence where the trafficker threatens the victim's family, sometimes the victim's child, in order to compel the victim to engage in a commercial sex act, so the threats don't have to be directly at the victim, per se. 
Um, and then also a scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause a person to believe that, again, failure to perform the act, and usually it's a commercial sex act, would result in serious harm to, serious harm to or physical restraint, and then the abuse or threatened abuse of the legal process. That third bullet point often comes up in the context of, hey, victim, you're here illegally. If you don't engage in this commercial sex act, I'm gonna report you to authorities and perhaps have you deported, um, or something along those lines in terms of threatening the abuse of the legal process in order to get a victim to engage in a commercial sex act. Coercion, again, remember really this is a lot about coercion because as Special Agent indicated, the movie Taken is not really a play here. It's talking to the victim as to why a victim um, engaged in a commercial sex act even though he or she was left alone in a motel room knowing that her trafficker was gone. Why did you feel compelled then to still engage in that commercial sex act when you were not like chained to a bed or something like that? So we have to talk to the jury and prove these elements of coercion. It can be subtle or overt, uh, physical or psychological. As I indicated, directed at the victim or to a third person. Um, Excuse me, sorry. And so we really have to get inside the mind of the victim as to why he or she, usually she, engaged in that commercial sex act. Uh, human trafficking prosecutions are often a little different than other ones. So for example, when you charge somebody with illegally possessing a firearm or illegally distributing methamphetamine, we have to convince the jury as to why the defendant knowingly did something. Why did you knowingly possess a gun? Why did you knowingly distribute drugs to somebody else? We have to do that here as to get inside the head of the defendant why he engaged in sex trafficking, but critically, we have to get inside the head of the victim. So, Miss Victim, why did you do this? What's going on, what was going on in your life at the time that you were involved in this relationship with the trafficker? Why did you feel compelled to engage in a commercial sex act? Why did you feel like you had no choice? Were you dependent on drugs and the trafficker was giving you drugs and then withholding them to cause a withdrawal to, engage you to, to cause you to engage in the Commercial Sex Act? That can be coercion. Was the trafficker threatening your ch child? Was the, the trafficker threatening to call CPS? Was the trafficker taking away all your phones and limiting your connection to social media so you couldn't contact friends or family? We really have to do a deep dive into the relationship between the victim um, between the victim and the trafficker in terms of flush out those coercion elements to convince a jury as to why a victim, <coughs> excuse me, engaged in commercial sex act. Uh, we often try and look at text messages, so real-time text messages or Facebook messages or what have you between the victim and trafficker. Uh, that sometimes can be very fruitful in terms of evidence. We often talk to friends and family of the victim at the time who may have observed how the trafficker uh, treated the victim. Um, the special agent will probably talk about various other pieces of evidence, but we really try and get in as much contemporaneous corroborating evidence as possible uh, to flesh out how that victim was being um, treated by the trafficker at the time so we can tell the story why the victim felt like she had no choice. Uh, these really are the elements for sex trafficking, and by elements, the elements we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. If there ever is a trial, we go to trial. Uh, the first column on the left is kind of the acts that the trafficker has to engage in. Um, transports, provides, obtains, advertises, maintains, entices, recruits, uh, solicits. Uh, typically, it's not that difficult uh, to show up one of those first means on the left. Um, the trafficker is transporting, the trafficker is soliciting, the trafficker is maintaining. That's really not what the argument tends to be about in these cases. Again, it really is about that second column. It's about force, fraud, or coercion. Uh, so why did the victim, why was she forced to engage in commercial sex? Critically, again, why was she coerced to engage in commercial sex? And then was a commercial sex act actually um, contemplated? Commercial sex act has to, hasn't, doesn't have to be accomplished, uh, but it has to be a contemplated as part of the sex trafficking charge here. So. Um, sometimes a special agent, and I'll talk to you about, will look at commercial sex ads on the internet. Sometimes, unfortunately, we'll have to show the ad to the victim or show the ad to the jury as to why this is a commercial sex case. But again, these prosecutions usually fall down to that second column. I talked about, and the special agent referred to the penalties. When we're talking about traditional sex trafficking under the federal code, 
Um, if we are able to convict a defendant of force fraud or coercion, coercing somebody to engage in commercial sex, it's a mandatory minimum 15 years to life in federal prison. Uh, that is if the victim is an adult. The victim being a default, def an adult, excuse me, is defined under federal code as someone who's 18 years or older. That is the definition of an adult in the federal code. If the victim is under the age of 18, uh, so the victim is between the ages of 14 and 17, and the distinction is, is matters for, and I'll tell you in a second, we don't have to show forced fraud or coercion. We just have to show the defendant knew the victim's age or had a reasonable opportunity to observe the victim such that he or she knew the age, or had reason to know the age of the victim. If that's the case, and the victim is aged between 14 and 17, again, we're not showing forced fraud or coercion, it's a mandatory minimum 10 years in federal prison. If the victim is under the age of 14, then it's back to 15 years, but again, we're not having to show or convince a jury or prove forced fraud or coercion. So when I talk about how the rubber meets the road in terms of coercion and force and fraud, um, really it comes down to the victim being an adult. And again, adult is defined as someone 18 years or senior. on this slide uh, is a little bit dated. Uh, this was a study do, done in 2007. Uh, this problem has expanded exponentially since then. Uh, in, in these uh, cities listed here, um, depending on which city it was, I think uh, Denver was 40 million to 290 million in, in uh, Atlanta. Um, that is how much money uh, is being made by traffickers way back in 2007. Um, during, as part of this study, they interviewed the traffickers, um, and uh, per week, the traffickers were making $5,000 to $33,000 way back in 2007. So the, this is uh, Zeno's slide. Remember a few moments ago I talked about how what the principal federal human trafficking statutes are, but we often charge people under a, a, a kind of smorgasbord of other statutes, if you will, um, because perhaps we can't, we can't satisfy those elements of the human trafficking statutes I just referenced. So there are some other statutes at our disposal, and I'll talk in more detail here about a few of them. The Mann Act, some of you may know, is really a transportation statute at its core, so it's transporting somebody usually across state lines for an illegal purpose. Uh, the Travel Act usually involved really using a telephone or instrumentality of interstate commerce, usually a phone, uh, essentially to promote prostitution or commercial sex. Um, and then kidnapping is the federal statute, and really that's what the common sense understanding is. You're essentially kidnapping somebody um, with heightened penalties if the victim is a minor. Uh, we, also, we often look at these other ones as well. Sometimes they come up in human trafficking investigations. You have various immigration laws. Again, immigration laws directed towards the defendant, towards the trafficker. Uh, money laundering, extortion, false documents. Um, so again, if you ever see a kind of a sex trafficking story in the paper or read a charging document, um, you may see some of these other statutes lift, li listed um, and knowing that it is a sex trafficking case but involves a lot of different statutes. <clears throat> So I talked about the Mann Act. Uh, it is defined there for transportation for prostitution or illegal sexual activity. Really just means transporting ac somebody across state lines for the purpose of illegal sexual conduct. Uh, the maximum penalty if the victim is an adult, same definition of adult, is up to 10 years in federal prison. Uh, you have a coercion and enticement statute. Really, that means you're using an instrumentality of interstate commerce, typically the, a cellular telephone or the internet or Facebook or social media or something like that, uh, to coerce somebody to engage in illegal sexual activity. Uh, depending on whether the victim, again, is a minor or adult, uh, the penalties there change. Uh, I think it's up to zero to 20, and then perhaps a 10-year mandatory minimum in federal prison if the victim is an adult. And then transportation of minors, um, which really across state lines for the purpose of illegal sexual activity. Again, because it's a minor, you have enhanced penalties under the federal code. Uh, there are the elements for the transportation charge, the Mann Act charge I, I mentioned here a few moments ago. Um, that's all we really have to show 
Um, but again, we have to satisfy our burden as the government. So working with the FBI, working with our state counterparts, working with a variety of investigative resources, we have to track down all the evidence that corroborates usually a victim's account that was she, was, she or she was transported across state lines for the purpose of illegal sexual activity, often being prostitution or commercial sex. Sometimes we look at flight records, sometimes we look at bus records, uh, sometimes we look at location data on a cell phone so we can see the movement of a person across state lines. Obviously the purpose is relevant for the statute, so not only do we have the victim's account, you know, I talk to my trafficker, I talk to the defendant as to why I was being transported, but we have to corroborate that to the extent we can. So did she tell anybody else that? Were there commercial sex ads posted in the jurisdiction they were driving to or transporting to? All these things are kind of evidence points that we have to look at in terms of going forward on a Mann Act charge, again, a transportation charge. But also, as you see there, there is an attempt theory as well. So even if the transportation wasn't fully completed, even the Commercial Sex Act didn't fully occur, we can go forward on an attempt theory. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, it's up to 10 years in federal prison. I refer a second ago also to coercion and enticement for a person to travel. Uh, sometimes these cases involve a defendant being in Montana and finding a victim or finding somebody who is located somewhere else in the United States and somehow they engage in a, con a conversation, whether it's on the phone or again, social media or what have you, and it becomes clear why that victim is gonna travel from wherever he or she is to the state of Montana, which is to engage in commercial sexual activity. Uh, it's very similar to a man act in this case off also, however, the defendant doesn't travel. Usually he or she is located in Montana and just coerces or entices. So just presenting the opportunity, if you will, to travel to Montana to engage in illegal activity. And again, we have the attempt statute, attempt theory, and it's up to 20 years in prison. Uh, transportation of a minor. Uh, for purpose of prostitution, we have charged this before as well. Again, it is the Mann Act theory, this time the victim obviously being somebody under the age of 18. Uh, the critical thing is this ignorance of the child's age is no defense to the law. So. A defendant can't go to trial and say, I, I was unaware of the victim's age. I thought he or she was 20. I didn't realize she was a 16-year-old girl. We as a society place the risk on somebody who transports transport somebody across state lines for the purpose of illegal activity. That victim or that person may be a child or not. So it's a very nice provision of this statute. Uh, again, we have to firm up the Mann Act and the transportation piece that I've been talking about. But if the victim is a minor, um, we can go forward and it carries a hefty penalty up to, yeah, it's a mandatory minimum of 10 years in federal prison up to life. Um, <clears throat> this is come, kind of dovetails with the child exploitation kind of work that Special Agent Walter and other agents and I work on as well. It's not strictly human trafficking. Often this comes up in the context of a defendant who is corresponding um, with somebody online, and that somebody online is often a child, again, under the age of 18, and it becomes clear the defendant is traveling interstate commerce for the purpose of engaging in illegal sexual activity with that, uh, with that child. Um, so they often go hand in hand, unfortunately, in the human trafficking and human um, prosecution context, but we just have to show, again, the defendant traveled with a motivating purpose to engage in illicit sexual conduct <clears throat> with somebody he believed to be a minor, excuse me. And that is up to 30 years in federal prison. <coughs> this is the Travel Act. Um, it is wordy, it is kind of legalese intensive, but really it involves using a means of facility of interstate commerce I referred to earlier. Often it's a telephone or the internet or social media um, to engage in or facilitate the promotion of prostitution there at the bottom. Um, sometimes this is charged against individuals that are colloquially known as Johns, so commercial sex customers. Um, it's not very often, but apparently often, it's like from time to time that charge will be levied. And again, the factual context is a commercial sex customer using his or her cell phone to arrange a commercial sex date. Uh, that is a viable federal charge. We have charged it before in the past and it's up to five years in federal prison. 
Um, I don't know if the special agent, well, so I, again, I'm a federal prosecutor, so this is not my area of expertise with respect to Montana Code, uh, but there are some significant penalties in the Montana Code with respect to some of the subject areas we've been talking about. Uh, my understanding is they have been recently amended, um, and by amended, they become, I think, more government friendly, and also the penalties have increased. Um, I think that generally reflects, frankly, a change in society over the last 30, 40 years with respect to this subject matter. Uh, you've seen some of the penalties um, increase with respect to various amendments to criminal law. So again, I don't get involved in these statutes very often. Uh, I have some wonderful counterparts in the state that charge these. Um, some of these cases go state, sometimes they go federal. Uh, we, all, we all get along in terms of kind of going after these bad guys, but there are a lot of statutes at our state counterparts disposal, and I know these, they use these quite often. <clears throat> and I'll turn it over to the special agent for some of the statistics that we've seen. So I, I'm not a lawyer myself. Uh, you can see there's many uh, ways that individuals can be prosecuted under both these state and uh, federal laws. Um, I would say uh, when somebody comes up and says, are we seeing this crime in Billings, Montana, Zeno, I would believe that 90% uh, of those statutes, uh, you have charged those cases right here in Billings. Uh, so that is, that is happening. Uh, some of those we, Zeno would utilize to charge more often than others. Um, but these crimes are happening right here. Uh, federal crimes uh, and state crimes as defined by Montana Code annotated are happening right here in Billings. Uh, no question in my mind that type of a crime happens every day in Billings. Uh, so with that being said, um, just to give you some statistics on commercial sex trafficking, uh, three in four adult prostitutes were introduced into commer the commercial sex trade when they were minors. Uh, so this is something that uh, they were introduced to at a vulnerable spot in their life when they were still a child. Uh, and now they continue to do that, whether that be this is the, the path of least resistance for them, uh, whether they're still being forced or coerced into that activity. Uh, that's another question. Uh, oftentimes, uh, particularly commercial sex buyers that we come into contact with believe that uh, since they ask a female um, that they're planning to have to pay for commercial sex since they asked her, are you living your best life? Is this what you want to be doing? And her answer was yes, I'm, I'm happy with my life. Um, oftentimes there's many more layers to that. Uh, and while she's saying that, uh, this might be because uh, if she doesn't do this, uh, she's going to get hit in the face when she gets back to the other hotel room that he's staying in. Uh, if she doesn't do this, she might be fearful that her child, who is on the other side of the state of Montana, and that trafficker knows where that child is and knows who is taking care of that child. Uh, there's many reasons why she's uh, telling that commercial sex customer what he wants to hear. Uh, and oftentimes it isn't the case that she is doing what she wants to be doing. Oftentimes she is not getting any of that money from that co commercial sex transaction or maybe getting a McDonald's hamburger uh, so that she's not hungry uh, for the next commercial sex customer to come to her room. Um, so it, it's a very complicated situation. Uh, I will say that there are some women that are independently doing this in, in Billings, Montana, uh, and those women uh, were exposed to this. Again, three out of four of them were exposed to this as a child. Uh, so they're sort of stuck in this catch-22 situation where they could potentially get a minimum wage job uh, or get $15 an hour somewhere. Uh, but in Billings, Montana, uh, for commercial sex, uh, the going rate is uh, probably on the low end, $150 for one hour. Um, and it can go up from there. I've seen higher numbers than that. Um, so now they might be trying to take care of kids. They were introduced to this life. They're still carrying all that trauma with them. Uh, and now they have to ask themselves, can I work for $15 an hour or would it be better if I made $150 in an hour? Um, so I, I won't argue with people in that there are women that are doing this independently. 
Um, but most of the time when we come into contact with uh, women, particularly those that are traveling through Billings, uh, they have traffickers. I talked about this statistic before. One in three minors living on the street will be approached by a trafficker within two days. Um, traffickers are very charming individuals. Sometimes they're good looking individuals. Sometimes they're dressed well. They can speak well. Uh, they have the capability to do whatever they want to in this life, uh, but they choose to be human traffickers. Um, they make this choice because potentially it was something that they were taught when they were growing up. Uh, maybe their uh, father figures uh, showed them this life. Um, but they are simply predators that are preying on vulnerable people, uh, including kids in our community. The average age of a minor who becomes involved in commercial sex is 14 years old. Uh, in the cases that Zeno and I have worked, the number is probably a little higher than that, um, probably 17 or 18 in the cases we've seen in Billings. A human trafficker can make about $100,000 on each victim each year. Uh, and I've seen numbers, I've seen traffickers um, talk about $300,000 per year per victim. Um, a lot of uh, traffickers have multiple victims. Uh, so this is a very lucrative trade for them. Um, again, we kind of touched on this. Not all prostitutes are victims of, of sex trafficking, but most of them began as victims of sex trafficking, oftentimes when they were children. Uh, minor victims um, who have a pimp are always victims of sex trafficking. They cannot consent to that activity. Uh, so they are sex trafficking victims as defined by state and federal law. Uh, human trafficking ranks second to only the illegal trade um, as the largest international uh, crime industry in the world. Um, there is another piece to this, and that is that um, if you think about those two crimes, uh, the drug trade and the trade in humans, um, the drug trade uh, is risky. You have to potentially interact with a Mexican cartel to get your product. When you're out of that product and you sell out of it, you need to replenish that product. So again, you need to risk potentially come in contact with law enforcement who might be involved in an investigation involving that Mexican cartel. Um, so it's risky to you. Uh, there's also drug rips that happen. Uh, you go to buy your product instead of giving you the product. They simply shoot at you and take your money from you. Uh, it's risky. Uh, in, with human trafficking, all you have to do uh, is have a hotel room and bring a McDonald's hamburger uh, by uh, every day, uh, and you can continually reuse and recycle that product. So uh, there are definite reasons why traffickers um, choose sex trafficking compared to drug trafficking. Uh, traffickers use um, factors, uh, again, use uh, needs um, uh, or vulnerabilities. If a, a trafficking victim has a history of abuse, the, uh, tra the trafficker will offer a relationship. I'm going to be your boyfriend. Uh, if the child is a runaway, uh, I'm going to offer you a family and a home. These are the other girls that um, uh, will be your family. Uh, if you're economic, economically vulnerable, uh, the trafficker will offer you income. Uh, oftentimes, uh, kids these days, their cell phone is very important to them. If they could have the iPhone 14 as opposed to dad's old iPhone 6, uh, that might be enough of a pull reason to get them uh, to at least get in the car with you. Uh, if somebody is marginalized by any number of factors, acceptance is what the trafficker is offering. So victims of sex trafficking, um, there are a number of indicators um, of sex trafficking. Um, oftentimes, uh, a, an individual who comes into contact with law enforcement will lie about their age, or they won't have their own identification with them. Uh, they'll be vague about their uh, personal history. They, they will provide scripted answers that the trafficker, the pimp, uh, has told them to answer. We're just on vacation here. Um, it, it's always very important to separate the trafficker uh, from the victim uh, and get separate stories from them. They'll claim that they are just visiting. They won't know where they've been or they won't know where they're going to. Um, they lack knowledge of where they're headed to. 
Uh, they may have very few personal possessions with them. They might not even have a suitcase. They would just have a, a, a grocery bag with their clothes or what clothes they have in them. Uh, you'll see indications of frequent travel. They might have multiple uh, electronic key cards from different hotels on them. Uh, oftentimes what we see is a minor that's with an individual of a different race. Um, and it doesn't make sense that that individual uh, of a different race would be with this child. Uh, they'll also oftentimes have a controlling uh, boyfriend figure uh, where you see them walk into Walmart. Um, the, the boyfriend's walking in front. Uh, they're looking down at the ground. They're not making eye contact with anybody. That would be a, a potential flag of trafficking. Oftentimes, these victims are branded or tattooed um, with various uh, <coughs> different kinds of tattoos. Um, we've seen barcodes on girls. We've seen uh, the trafficker's street name tattooed across the top of their chest in reverse script. So when they look into a mirror, they see, um, just like you look into your mirror and you see an ambulance behind you, it's spelled out correctly because it's a mirror reflection. They're looking into the mirror and right above their chest, their, tra their pimp's uh, street name is, is tattooed there in reverse. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we will catch them with prepaid cards, money grams. Um, we already talked about hotel card keys. Um, we found tr uh, females in a Billings motel uh, that have been in Billings for three days, and in the safe in their hotel, they have $5,000 in cash. Uh, and they've also been taking some of that money to Walmart or sending it by MoneyGram or even sending it electronically to their pimp who's never stepped foot in the state of Montana. Uh, again, some other indicators of, of trafficking, uh, multiple unre unrelated persons staying in the same place, uh, unrelated females staying in a hotel room here in Billings. We already talked about this, um, the, the boyfriend leading uh, the way into Walmart and doing all the talking uh, for, for the female. This, we, we've seen this in our hospitals also, uh, where they'll get there, somebody will be injured, they'll go into the emergency room, uh, and the, the dominant male will be doing all the talking for the patient. <coughs> Again, uh, these victims sometimes do not have control over their money. We've seen some sexual paraphernalia. Um, it doesn't make sense for a kid to have a Costco-sized pack of condoms with them. We've seen that before. Um, lubrication, sex toys, baby wipes with no baby present, um, obviously to clean up after a commercial sex interaction. Um, what people need to look for is dramatic changes in behavior of a child. If your child is getting straight A's and all of a sudden uh, the child is getting D's and F's, uh, that's something that you need to pay attention to. Uh, sometimes uh, expensive clothes, electronics, um, uh, the, the type of clothing you might expect uh, to be involved in commercial sex. Um, it doesn't make sense for a child to have more than one cell phone. Many of us might have more than one cell phone. One's a personal one that we pay dearly for, and the other one our work uh, pays for. That doesn't make sense for a child to have that. Um, and again, we've talked about hotels. Um, sometimes when we go into rooms, we'll see on the hotel notepad um, multiple numbers written down, uh, and those numbers will be oftentimes 406 numbers. Uh, we had a case uh, a few years ago that Zeno and I worked on together uh, where there was a man that was living in Billings uh, a number of years ago. Since he knew the area, when he saw social media profiles of females posted in Billings, he would make contact with them and try and recruit them as human trafficking victims. Uh, he, he at one point decided that he was going to see how much money he could make, uh, and he posted a commercial sex ad for this particular female that Zeno and I were dealing with. Uh, and we had access to that phone number uh, within uh, the span of two days, that phone number had r received about 150 calls, um, mo many of them from 406, um, uh, with the 406 area code, 
that is how much demand there is for commercial sex in Billings, Montana. Some of them were out of state numbers, but as we know, oftentimes people that live in Billings maintained a cell phone number from some other place when they came here. So my guess is that at least 75% of those customers were right here from Billings. We'll talk a little bit about the terminology of what's referred to as the game, that is commercial sex trafficking. Uh, there are different types of uh, pimps, uh, two of those being the gorilla pimp, which is what many of us know. Those are the violent pimps, those that use force, violent force, uh, to get a, tra uh, a human trafficking victim to abide by the rules and perform commercial sex. Oftentimes what Zeno and I see in the beginning, it's the finesse pimp, the Romeo pimp, or the boyfriend pimp. Uh, that is, you're beautiful, uh, I wanna rescue you from this situation, I want you to be my girlfriend. That's how it starts. And then after some point, he'll, he will come back and say, I've been supporting you, I put a roof over your head, I've been feeding you the last few days, um, now you're gonna do this for me. Uh, when that female victim gets tired of um, doing commercial sex, at some point then he might transition and become a gorilla pimp, uh, and that is violent to enforce his rules. Some other terms for a pimp include daddy, mac, or pi. A bottom is the most trusted victim, so if a trafficker has multiple uh, female human trafficking victims, his bottom girl is the one that is in charge of training the new recruits, uh, sometimes recruiting the new recruits uh, and training them how to work in commercial sex uh, safely and efficiently, that is safely for the pimp uh, so that the pimp doesn't get into trouble um, and enforcing the pimp's rules. So I grew up in Billings and uh, when I was in high school, uh, this crime was different. It was more visible than it is today. That's because the internet didn't exist. Um, you couldn't very well place an ad in the Billings Gazette um, for commercial sex. Uh, so the females had to stand out on Montana Avenue. And I can remember uh, driving down Montana Avenue and seeing the females standing there. This is, n it's not this way anymore. Um, the traffickers don't need to leave their hotel rooms. The trafficking victims can also be present in the hotel room ready to accept the next customer. Uh, everything is done over the internet. So in Billings, we have basically three flavors of this problem of trafficking. Uh, we have um, travelers that are traveling on the interstate highway system, sometimes flying into Billings uh, on a cheap Allegiant ticket from some large city. Uh, and they are coming here to perform commercial sex, sometimes for a pimp that never left the city that they came from. Uh, sometimes the pimp is traveling with them by car down I-90 and they got tired when they got to Billings, they decided to take a break. Uh, and even before, when that pimp is in Bozeman, uh, he knows that he uh, could potentially make money in Billings. So even in between here and Bozeman, he's on his phone posting the ad for commercial sex in Billings. Um, that's one of our problems. Another problem that we have are local victims, our kids um, many times being victimized uh, by these human traffickers. And they can be individuals traveling through or they can be individuals living here in Billings. Zeno and I have seen both. Uh, massage parlors are another issue uh, that has been addressed both by law enforcement and by the city of Billings. Um, and if you've been paying attention to that, uh, you will note that many of our massage parlors, if you would have asked me a few years ago, I would say there were 15 active massage parlors in Billings. The number is much smaller than that. Um, it, we are more on the line of other cities in Billings now that have one, two, or three active uh, illicit massage parlors in Billings. Uh, social media is another way to get the word out. Um, Facebook, Tinder, Meet Me, these are these are both platforms that the traffickers look at in order to recruit or spot potential uh, vulnerable victims. Um, and they're also platforms that they might utilize to advertise. So here are some statistics when Zeno and I started uh, working in uh, this area uh, from October of 16 to October of 17. This is the number of ads, commercial sex ads that were posted in Billings, Montana, almost 20,000 in that year. 
Uh, I told people when I gave this presentation in 2017 that that number was artificially high and it had to do with our uh, illicit massage parlor businesses in Billings because sometimes they would post three or four or five times per day um, just one single illicit massage business and we had about 15 at that time. Uh, so Bozeman and Missoula were second uh, and third uh, and then some of our other cities were about half of the number of ads posted in, in our other cities. So there used to be a website called Backpage.com. Has anybody ever been on uh, Craigslist? So Backpage.com was modeled a little bit like Craigslist, except its sole purpose uh, was, to, uh, was to promote commercial sex. Um, at some point, both state and federal uh, law enforcement uh, went after Backpage and they were able to shut it down. These are some of the websites that replaced it. Uh, once you knock one website down, uh, others come back in to replace it. Uh, so in 2018, there were federal statutes passed uh, where the website operators could be held liable uh, for commercial sex being conducted off of their website. Uh, that's what happened to Backpage. Now many of these sites are now headquartered. Uh, their servers are located in, in countries that don't cooperate um, with uh, the United States federal government. I recalculated some statistics um, in May of 2021 to May of 2022. You can see there was a huge drop in the number of commercial sex ads posted for billings in that time frame, 5,700 compared to the 19,000 from just about uh, five years before that. Um, that has to do with the city of Billings and law enforcement shutting down many of the illicit massage parlors. It also has to do with the fact that the ads are, are different now. There are different websites hosting them, uh, many of them overseas. Uh, so you can see again, Missoula and Bozeman are, are definitely second and third on this list. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the Skip the Games ad from today, uh, just before coming over here. I pulled this up. Uh, these are the group of females that are advertising commercial sex in Billings, Montana on March 27th, 2023. Uh, so when you pull up the ad now, uh, I encourage you to take a look at it on your own phone or computer. Probably don't do this at work, um, but use your own phone or your own computer and pull this up and take a look at it and see what is um, what is available. If you click on the picture, an ad comes up something like this. Uh, and it tells you about this female. It tells you race, hair color, uh, whether she's available for in-call and out-call. In-call and out-call is defined by the female. If it's an in-call, you are the commercial sex customer is going to meet that victim wherever she's at. If it's an out-call, the victim will come out and meet you at your house or your, or your, uh, home, or your hotel room, wherever you are. Um, you can see the, the height is described, her, her personal uh, description is described, and then she posts a phone number down there. Um, the customer would then uh, direct message, a text, send a text message to her or call her directly uh, and talk to her about organizing um, a commercial sex date. Oftentimes they'll say only calls, no calls are being accepted. Uh, that's because the pimp is the person on the other side of that phone, and he can't make his voice sound like a female, so he is texting uh, back and setting up the date for her, and then he will, at some other, at, at some time point, let her know there's going to be this guy, this is what he looks like, this is how old he is, this is what his name is. He is going to give you $250 for an hour of sex, um, and she just waits at the room for that person to come. Tris.link uh, is another website uh, that was set up uh, by three entrepreneurs from, uh, I think, a, a former Soviet state. Um, and they portray themselves as individuals trying to help uh, women who want to live their best life um, as uh, working in commercial sex. Uh, this is how they portray themselves. What I can tell you about Trist uh, is I worked a case um, with Zeno uh, in the last uh, few years in which we had a 15-year-old child that was being advertised on Trist. 
Um, and I thought, well, if these are uh, truly what these women are, it, it was a man and two women, if they're truly trying to uh, elevate women um, and help them to work their best life in commercial sex, uh, then if I contact them as an F FBI agent and say, you have a 15-year-old being advertised on your website, would you take that down? That they will respond to me. I never got a single response from them. So this is, uh, again, Trist, um, the posting today for Billings, Montana. Uh, I think there was actually one more female that I couldn't fit on this uh, slide. These are the females uh, selling commercial sex in Billings today as part of this uh, website. These are the three individuals that um, developed this tryst. Um, and again, um, they put out, why don't we, why don't we decriminalize uh, commercial sex work? The problem with that is um, if, if we already, uh, as law enforcement and as a community, cannot protect our kids, how are we going to protect our kids when we've decriminalized a crime that we already can't approach with the resources uh, of the FBI, with the resources of the US, United States Attorney's Office, with the resources of the County Attorney's Office. We already can't protect our kids. Uh, we cannot decriminalize something like this. Uh, it simply would not work. Again, uh, more of the propaganda put out by Trist. Um, the, the truth of the matter is um, commercial sex trafficking happens every day in our community. Um, as you saw, there were seven women advertised on Trist. There were more like 15 advertised on Skip the Games. And these are just two of the websites. Um, there are other victims um, on other websites that aren't posting on Trist or Skip the Games today. Um, so there's no question in my mind there are probably um, on any day in Billings uh, two commercial sex trafficking victims that are forced into this activity one of those is probably a child, uh, and I'm being very conservative in that estimate. Uh, when there are events that are happening in our community, um, such as um, a, a turnaround, uh, a maintenance turnaround at our local refineries, uh, we have had female victims um, tell us that their pimp came into contact with one of these customers who told them uh, there's going to be a, a maintenance um, uh, effort at one of our refineries. There's going to be uh, many men coming into our community. They're leaving their, their wives and girlfriends in other communities. Um, you should come to Billings uh, to, to do your sex trafficking. That kind of thing happens. We've had uh, victims tell us directly, uh, I left from Boise um, because I had some, somebody tell me uh, that Billings had a refinery turnaround or had a basketball tournament, tournament or something coming to town. Um, and I chose to tell my, my trafficker that, and then he said, pack your stuff up from Boise, put that 16-year-old, that 15-year-old that you have with you uh, in the car with you and drive out to Billings and we'll see how much money we can make there. So we are about four minutes past the hour. Um, some of you may have questions. I put up uh, my information up here. Uh, again, my desk phone, my cell phone, uh, and my email address, and I've put uh, Z Zeno's uh, email address up here. Uh, the human trafficking number uh, that I told you about before is the national hotline number. Um, sometimes I have gotten reports locally, and sometimes I have known that that re same report went to the human trafficking hotline number, and I've never heard about that report. So there are a group of individuals in Missoula, Montana uh, that are part of a, an organization called the Lifeguard Group, uh, and they have uh, another telephone number that is tailored specifically to Montana. These are people that Zeno and I work with. Um, their number is 833-406-STOP, uh, and that is the Montana 24-7 uh, uh, staff uh, hotline for human trafficking victims. Do you have any closing remarks, Zeno? Yeah, just an obvious point, and it echoes when I started thanking you for coming out this afternoon. I mean, the reason I think Special Agent Walter and myself and many others engage in these kind of community forums is, for lack of a better term, to get the word out, right? Um, the more people are aware of this issue, 
Um, the more people who are at the mall or watching their friends and family or on the street observe someone who may be being trafficked and they know who to call. Um, so again, thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, please keep your eyes and ears open um, and hopefully together we can continue to combat this horrific, uh, horrific issue. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone has questions or comments or uh, would like to discuss anything about this, um, Zeno and I were planning on being here for an extra hour, but they told us to tailor it down uh, to 4 p.m. So does any, anybody have any questions? Yes. Why, why do you think those numbers in Bozeman and Missoula are so high? I think it has to do with being right on the I-90 corridor, uh, and it has to do with uh, the universities also. Um, we have uh, in operations, and sting operations, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of activity from university kids um, that might be potential customers for this. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's both of those things, being right on the I-90 and the universities. Billings uh, has always been the hot spot, um, and my, my belief is that has to do with what happened with the Bakken oil boom, um, and even though it's been many years since that happened, and it's, uh, it, it's tougher to extract a barrel of oil um, economically uh, today than it was a few years ago. Um, these human trafficking victims that were forced to come out to the oil Bakken boom to service uh, men who were making more money uh, than they had ever had in their lives. Uh, they're not living at home. Their wives and their girlfriends are not there. Um, Traffickers seized on that and they sent their trafficking victims to that area. When they traveled to that area, they came through Billings and they got tired in Billings and they stopped here and they developed a customer base. So we have seized cell phones out of uh, females' hands and once we analyzed them uh, in that phone, it says Billings Dave, Billings Mike, Billings Steve. These are what they consider regular customers now. So. Uh, now, even though that the Bakken may have slowed down, they know that they can travel from Denver to Billings and they'll have five or ten dates um, immediately set up because they haven't been back here for a month or two or three. Um, Mike and Dan and Steve will be sure bets uh, and they will come and they will pay that money and they know that Mike and Stan, Stan and, and Steve and Dan and Steve, they're, those are not... Uh, cops. They know for sure that they're going to make money and there's no risk there. Uh, so they're coming back to Billings now because they have regular customers and they're also advertising at the same time so they develop more regular customers. Uh, so I think that's why Billings problem is, is larger than Missoula and Bozeman uh, because of its proximity to the Bakken. Yes? What percentage are immigrants? Do you see a high number of immigrants here, or is it mostly local? Zeno uh, has worked a case, uh, a labor trafficking case with immigrants, um, but I cannot think of one. I, I guess I have to clarify that. Uh, we have had, um, in our massage parlors uh, in Billings, we have uh, come across victims um, that were immigrants. Um, many of them uh, came into the U.S. because they married service members uh, that were stationed in Korea, um, even some stationed in Vietnam. Um, so we have, we have a number of Korean uh, descent, but these are green card holders. They're U.S. Um, green card holders. So um, we have not seen I have not seen an immigrant as part of a commercial sex trafficking uh, case, um, but in the massage parlors, that's a different story. What do you offer the victims and survivors of this? Is there, or is that not your area? Do you have people you refer to? What happens to them? It's definitely uh, an area that we have come to address. So, uh, 
about quarterly in this room, uh, the Yellowstone County Area Human Trafficking Task Force meets. Um, and it is composed of a victim services section, a community education section, and a law enforcement and prosecution section. Um, so we work together with them. Um, our victim services uh, folks, um, when we started this back in 2016, this task force, we really didn't have a lot of options in Montana. I think there was uh, a safe house up by Missoula. Uh, since then, there's been a locally developed safe house, um, more than one actually, uh, that, that has been developed and there, there's a home, there's a place for these victims to go. Uh, what we saw in the beginning is a pimp approached this trafficking victim um, because she had a vulnerability and he observed that and she was in a bad situation and he offered her a better situation than she was in. That is, you're not hungry, you have a roof over your head, uh, you know what's gonna happen to you tomorrow. Even though it's commercial sex, she perceives this as a better situation. Um, but we then figured we needed to offer a third option that was better than that. Uh, the problem with Montana is often these females come from Southern California and they don't want to live in Montana when at the end of March it's snowing a foot. Um, they they want to get out of here. So even though there are options here, oftentimes they, they don't uh, choose to stay here. But that doesn't mean that we can't place them. There are other places. Uh, there are some... Uh, spread across the country, there are safe houses, there are places uh, where these females uh, can go and escape the physical and mental abuse that they've endured. Yeah. I was just uh, thinking back to the heat map that you showed earlier. Um, I wasn't sure what statistics were on there, but I was, I was curious, it looked like in the West that where the redder spots were, it was maybe correlated with reservations is there a relationship there just in terms of marginalized groups potentially so Taylor was asking about that heat map that I put up there before um, that heat map was just developed on the number of calls coming into the national hotline and it wasn't the reservations it was actually Billings and Missoula that were the hot spots um, mainly just the towns um, the I, I've worked as an FBI agent out on the reservations. Uh, there, there is sex trafficking happening out there. Um, sometimes uh, it has to do with what we would call survival sex trafficking, and that is kids, um, uh, for one reason or another, trying to obtain money or drugs or something else, uh, and they are putting themselves into that situation. Uh, we have observed uh, drug dealers, local drug dealers out on the reservations, uh, dabbling in trafficking. It's not a very hard step to make um, if you're dealing with Mexican cartels. Um, they're probably less afraid of the FBI than they are of, me of me Mexican cartels. So it's not a very hard criminal step to make. Uh, maybe I'll start thinking about utilizing some of these female uh, women around here um, to make money off of also. Um, we do see Native Americans when they come to Billings, they are a vulnerable population um, and uh, they are definitely being recruited and they are definitely being trafficked in Billings. Um, it's, uh, as you know, um, many times reservations are poor places. Um, so there might not be as much an opportunity to make as much money as you can make in Billings. So um, there's no question in my mind that individuals from the reservation and from other places have recruited Native Americans from Crow and Northern Cheyenne um, to work in commercial sex, oftentimes to work in commercial sex in Billings. I guess we'll close there. If there's nothing else, Zeno and I can hang around and answer individual questions.
Thank you all again for coming out for this installment of the Social Awareness Series. Uh, thank you, Zeno and Brandon, again, of course. Uh, these are heavy topics, so we appreciate everyone um, coming out and listening. Uh, these series consist of follow-up events. There is one in April, uh, April 8th. It's with uh, Heather Eustis, and she is the founder of um, The Worthy Ranch and Good Catering. Uh, so she'll be presenting uh, her, her organization and the work that they're doing for victims of human trafficking. There's flyers on the table just right out front if you're curious about that event, April 8th. Yeah, it'll be here in the community room, yep, at 3 p.m. on April 8th. So thank you all for coming out.